A superior knowledge does not submit to inferior knowledge. Right? So if it's superior, it can stand up to the test of time. Right? I've done that throughout my whole life, testing whether the knowledge that I was taught right, from when I was young was indoctrination or it was real truth. And most people are afraid to go on that journey because they don't know who they will become afterward. Well, the, the people, people get real, again, we're talking about the brain. The brain likes things the way it is. Mm -hmm. People come in trying to move the furniture around. They're like, yo, ooh, ooh. You know right. what I'm That's where that, that, that couch goes there. Right. You know? And, and we saw it. And I really, I really saw over the past few years just the politics, the pandemic, just a lot of things that they'll, they'll let the thing burn. I don't know if you ever, it was like a behavior when you're young. You, you, something was wrong and you left it wrong. You know what I'm saying? It, it felt like addressing it would be a bigger right, thing. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? And as a child, you're like, okay, I can get that. But now I'm seeing like, no, this is adults, right. governments mm -hmm. don't want to admit that they're wrong about something. Mm -hmm. So they just publish the papers and see who reads it. Just they'll just, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? They'll just, they'll no, just. You got to admit, look, we, we dropped a file. We didn't let nobody know, but you know, this is where we admit it. If you want to read them 500 pages real quick. Yeah. It's somewhere in the middle of page 250, but we ain't going to tell you. Yeah, bro. This is their way of admitting the truth. You know what I'm saying? 19 keys. 19, 19 keys. I appreciate my pops for teaching me how to be a guy. From a boy to a man and ultimately back into the natural state of being into a guy. As guys, we're supposed to always move with that higher self. And I have to be able to execute it. Having knowledge is not power. The execution of knowledge is power. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave because the only real knowledge you can get is knowledge of self. The highest level is power. The highest level is sovereignty. The highest level is higher country. The highest level is we own our own country. It's at a very high level. Appreciate it. Not eye level. Mm. A high I like level. that. It's time for a high level conversation. We're here for another high level another conversation. Another high level conversation. 19 keys and this is a high level conversation. Tap in with the guy. Peace family is 19 Keys. Welcome to another high level conversation. Today we have a very special guest as always. This is a brother who has made cinematic history, who has brought us very striking visual presentations and who has a very special place in culture. If you're familiar with his work, then you know he has worked with very great stars and he continues to do works in multiple mediums from video shoots, to art installations, to documentaries or movies. Now, it's not too many people that achieve greatness. There's a lot of people that try to direct. There's a lot of people that try to get into the film industry. But you have to have a certain passion for what you do and you have to have a certain genius and a certain vision for what you do to even direct. To be able to give direction so that the vision that's in your mind can actually be brought out when people are able to intake exactly what they're experiencing. So you become a curator of visuals. Here at High Level Conversations, we try to make sure that the direction and the flow of every episode allows you to jump into the experience so that you can feel like you were there. With the type of visuals that he has left us with, he has already left an impression and a mark on the whole entire world. And I always think about our guests in terms of if they didn't exist, what would the game be like? And it would be missing a lot of pivotal moments if we didn't have the great artistic eye and direction of the good brother, Director X. So I appreciate you being here today, brother. Hey, you might get into a high level man. conversation. Thanks for, yeah. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with a question, right? Because these are conversations, it's not an interview, it's a back and forth flow and a build. You know, I was thinking, as I was just thinking about what a director does, right? Being able to move the pieces and, and really have to think outside of self and be empathetic and aware of how everybody else is going to view the presentation, 
right? What they're going to experience, what they're going to feel. And I was thinking about that in terms of life, right? We are all the main characters in our own stories, right? Some of us have dramatic stories. Some of us have sad stories. Some of us, you know, go after the enemy and we become heroes in our own tales, right? And in the lives on a daily basis, I'm always thinking about my life, right? And how will my legacy end? And I'm thinking if I am a good director of my own main character, right? And in terms of that sort of external self, right? And you being the, the master of self that gets to direct your own movie, what do you think a good director for their own life looks like? If you can in terms of it as far as the way you put it together on screen. I mean, I don't know how to apply it to life, but I can tell you what I feel a good director is okay. and how that, and then everyone can make that analogy themselves. Um, the beginning is an understanding of the craft, right? You understand, I say, you gotta fuck with the camera, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm a director, I know my lenses, I know the equipment, I know how to apply that knowledge into a performance, how to, make a line be a little more if I do this, you know what I mean? And the lights and the, the wardrobe and the makeup. And then once you, once you have spent your time on the craft and just the art itself, well then now the next layer is understanding the workings of it. Well, if I want to do that shot with that piece of equipment, how long is that gonna take? Then if I want that other shot, how long is that gonna take? But when does the sun go down? And how long is it gonna take us to go to, to the next location? So now I need, so you understand? I start with my passion of the art, I just love it, and all I wanna do is study. I wanna study story structure, and camera, and acting, and then I layer back. I wanna be able to speak about the lights, and the equipment, and the makeup, and the wardrobe, and then another step back, I wanna be able to understand the logistics. If I put the trucks on that street, then what's that mean when we, you know, I'm saying? there's all these things. And then there's the next step back is the team that I have to motivate, lead, right? And part of the leadership of a team is that, okay, he knows what he's doing or she knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to feel like they're leading someone who deserves to be in their position, that knows what they're doing, yeah? So, all that knowledge comes together, go, oh, this guy knows, this guy knows the camera, this guy knows, okay, this guy knows all the pieces. Oh, he even knows the logistics. Okay, so now I got that. The team, is, the team feels like they're following a leader. Then, the, then there's another step past that. Are you respecting that team as human beings, right? There's a lot, we just know in life, there's people who feel they have a position, they're the boss, they get a little bit of power and suddenly they, Talk to yeah you, you yeah you don't want to right they feel that the, they they feel that they're better than people there's no other way to put it right so again now you got your craft you understand the craft now you understand the business you can say the logistics you understand the business yeah. okay now you understand the business now you are dealing with the team as people. Right? So yeah, you might be the guy that's getting me my burrito in the morning. Hey, X, what do you want in your burrito? Yeah, I can make it some, I'll run a little, you know what I'm saying? You're a person, first. All right, uh, eggs and, what do you know what I mean? When you get it, cool, all right, thanks. Thank you, man, I appreciate you, all right? On a human level, that makes sense. If you wanna to go to a business level, there ain't many people in this business that didn't start with getting people burritos. Kenya Barris got people their breakfast burrito. You know what I'm saying? I got people their breakfast. Like, this, this, this is a ground up game. So you could be even selfish about it. Treating people with respect is a smart play. Right. But that's just, it feels, you know what I'm saying? Just, I, some people can do all that. That's just a lot of effort to move through life. For me, when I hear that, I think about coming up with a grand strategy, right? So if I'm relating that to life, life is war. It's the way I look at it, right? We have daily battles, whether it's good battles or whether those battles where you're going against an opposing force. And oftentimes it's self wars, it's the internal wars that you go through. So I've been deep just on the thought process of the self wars that we have to go on a daily basis. So when we go to war, you wanna have strategies, right? So what you talked about at first is learning the craft, 
right? And if you're learning the craft, then you're being an observer, right? You're in constant state of study and development of self, right? And so therefore, you can start to learn the way of, right? So when you learn the tools, you learn the lights, you learn it, now you are learning the way of what it's like to be a director. Right? Or if somebody's getting a burrito, it's the way of, of being an assistant. Everything that's comprised to be able to do your job. Right? And then you can start to develop a philosophy towards that once you have an understanding. And that philosophy is your strategy. Right? So now you have an ability to say, this is the way I'm going to do things. Right? And then you talked about stepping back. So now I'm not doing things from the point where I'm just inside of it. I want to step back and I want to be able to understand it all. Right, what's the history of this? What's the dynamics? Right, what's the social settings? Right, what are the implications of what I'm doing? What's the long term vision for every instance of how I react? So, once you do that and you take that step back, you can create a campaign. Right, so this is moving like a military general, right? And that's how life is. So, I step back now, I create my campaign. How I'm gonna run my campaign? I'm gonna treat people right, I'm gonna treat people with respect. Right? I'm going to honor the vision. I'm going to honor the craft and the industry that I'm in, and I'm going to be a servant leader. I'm going to operate with empathy. Right? All of this is part of your campaign that you play out in life. Right? And so for me, I, I think about that because stepping back and being the director of your life is being intentional about the outcome of your life versus being tactical on a daily basis, reacting to things that happen. Right? You're going to find yourself you know, at your low level. You're never going to get to that high level unless you can be a critical thinker, take a step back, analyze, have a strategy, right? And so when we think about war, we always think of it in a negative way. But war is finding a way to get a desired outcome, especially when you are going against opposition, right? And there's so much opposition, it can just be competition, right? Or it can be self-debt, lack of fear, procrastination, right, insecurities. Those are the self wars that we go through on a daily basis, or even believing that we deserve it, right? And so those are the things that from people that have made it from lower levels of where they were just thinking about something to the actualization of it, they had to go through that battle and figure that out. And when you're able to reverse engineer, then you can wash, wrench, and repeat. And so you can now go to higher levels because what you said, what was key, you talked about stepping back at least three times. And each time you stepping back, you say, okay, I'm in the middle of this. Campaign was good for this. Now I got to step back and see the field again, right? And so every time you stepping back, you going to another high level, right? And so I think that that's a great introspection for people to think about their own life because I'm always figuring out, yo, how do I move the main character that is me? How do I use 19 keys? And what, let me see if I can fix you because I, I don't like the way you talk to that person. You know what I'm saying? You're probably not going to make them feel good. You might have hit them with the cold shoulder. And you might have just been in a bad mood, but that don't go towards your campaign based on how you want to win this war of life because you have a lot of things that could be against you, right? And so I think that's a dope story because listening to you, I was listening to, you know, your TEDx talks, and I did some brief brushing up on it, and just your deep passion, right, for the psyche, right, and understanding why we do things. Right? I believe that many people do things because they don't really have any self-mastery and they're constantly in a reactionary state. Right? They live in this low frequency vibration most of their lives and they're not really in control of their own character. Right? And the one tool that can get you in control of your character is something that you're passionate about which is mindfulness and meditation. Can we dig a little bit into your story of you know, the traumas that you went through of getting shot and how that allowed you to grow into the passion of understanding the mind better. I mean, it, it, was, it was a few things. The getting shot, I was shot at my own New Year's party. Mm. Uh, someone shot somebody on the dance floor. Mm. The bullet went through two people and hit me, right? And when I think about that, I actually, on a side bit, is what entertainment has done to us. How many movies have you seen where it's like a guy with a machine gun and like you take the body, you go, chin, 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 and you shoot the guy, show the machine gun, then he throws the body and he's safe and he shoots back, you know what I'm saying? Or Nino Brown grabbing the little girl. Yeah, let me tell you something, buddy. If someone shoots the guy in front of you with a machine gun, he shoot you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's soft tissue going you know, through. Yeah, when you he, when he hide behind the couch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> ain't making sick like we got bulletproof appliances. <laughs> you know what I'm like, but, but, but this gets in the people's heads, because yeah. why else would this guy put the, this gun in this man's chest and pull the trigger, not understanding how this all works, mm. right? And it hit me in my back. And just a little shift of my body, a little standing a little this way or a little that way would have been in my spine, mm. right? So when I did the TED Talk, I shaped it around this conversation. I used, so when, when I'm coming from entertainment, but I think coming from whatever it is you do, right? But I come from entertainment. I understand story structure, right? I understand how to frame something. So th those of us that are in the entertainment space, taking that knowledge of whether it's making a song or making some art or whatever it is you do, and, and then now applying that to what we wanna say to the community, Right, so I took that. That TED Talk is is structured like a screenplay. Mm. Right. So what what's the before we even get to the uh, meditation and the mindfulness, the screenplay. So for somebody that wants to tell their story, and they want to do it in that manner, can you give me a breakdown of those steps? Yeah. So there's a there's a book called Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, in in that book, if you either read that book, there's a beat sheet in it. But they break down how the story structure goes. So, message to the man who shocked me. The first thing, every movie you think of, at least, you know, say like uh, Star Wars or something, but every movie you have the introduction. You want a big, hard-hitting introduction, right? In Star Wars, it's the, the little spaceship and then the big spaceship. You go, oh shit, what's this? Yeah. In, in the TED Talk, I look directly at the camera and instead of doing the, you know, the Steve Jobs TED Talk, I look at the camera and say, message to the man who shot me. You remember the night. You came to my New Year's party. Good, light, good lighting change. That, um, was that was dramatic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you feel what I'm saying? So you have your introduction. And this applies to everything. It's not, this isn't just, oh, story structure. This works for a sales pitch, right? You're, you're making your sales deck. When you learn how to use your mind, that's when you start to operate the system body. You start to tap into your God body. That's when you operate and learn how to take your thoughts and form them into reality. That's when you pull things from the darkness and bring it into light into reality. And that's when you have the power to change the world and you can bring wealth into generations into your family. There's power that's going on, why don't you go grab it? There's crowns out there, why don't you put your hand on? There's a lot of people in front of you, why don't you knock it down and slap the devil and tell him it's your hand what we waiting for? I'm ready to go to the highest level. If you ready to come rock with us, if you ready to build with us, because we're not waiting on nobody. Once we get on the mission, we in motion, and we devote it, we get liberation to our people. Our freedom ain't talking about the identity that's connected to the evils that the agenda gives you. No, we're talking about actually knowing that you got and staying tall and speaking to the power against all odds. They look at me and say, how's you a black man? How you walk, how you talk, how you dress, how you move, how you move. Why you know yourself so much? Why you so damn cool? Why you got confidence? Because I decided that I would never live at the lowest level. That's the same. I decided I would be a doctor. Every single day I got to wait until I got to try it. We're going to the highest level. Make sure y'all come with us. The highest level tour is, you know, it's, it's a moment in, in history that we get to think about and relish in and be a part of. This is me proving my thought leadership. This is me implementing the ideas and reinvigorating the spirit that we're going to need to win the future right now. So you have your introduction. You want to hit them with something impactful, okay? After you do your introduction, you need to state the theme of what it is you're saying, yeah? So at my introduction, I tell the story, or I got shot, then I say, I went to the ho I spent the rest of that night in, a, in the emergency room getting the bullet cut out of my side, mm. thinking, what would make someone do something like that? 
The audience doesn't know it, but I've just primed them for what the entire thing is going to be about. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? Set up. Right? So that's the theme stated. Every movie, they state the theme. Then, oh, a good movie. There's some. <laughs> yeah. then, then you get into the setup. Okay? So um, I said, what would make someone do something like that? And then I began to set up basically who I am. Right? I talk about, uh, I talk about how the city goes crazy, but there's a, there's a setup stage. You're setting up all, in a movie, you'd be setting up your characters, right? Um, for me, I set up who I am, right? So I go, oh, uh, you know, I, I, did some, I did some reports, I did some, I did some articles, and, but then I went back to work. So I made some videos, and I put up a video of, I put up a clip of Hotline Bling. Made a movie, Superfly, made a TV show, Mr. Tachyon, right? And I, so two things I'm setting up. So whatever is, if in a movie you're setting up your characters, right? In this context, I was setting up that I work with celebrities because I know in people's brains, just the way we think in our world, is, oh, you work with a celebrity. Oh, you're a celebrity makeup artist. You're a celebrity chef. You're a celebrity driver. The, the, you must be really good because the famous people want to work with you. I dropped the line about Mr. Tachyon because that's a science show. So the setup happens, and then you have a catalyst. Obi-Wan Kenobi says to Luke, come with me, come with me on this journey, right? Because we set it up, Jedi's and all that kind of stuff. So you have, your, you have your catalyst. Something happens that changes everything. Can't go back. The catalyst of message to the man who shot me is the city of Toronto goes crazy. Yeah. We're in Toronto, so everyone remembers that year, kids are getting shot on Young Street, kids are getting shot on Queen, just everywhere you turn, gun violence, okay? So now from your catalyst is the debate. You, you talk about it, and you debate that thing. So the, the key here in your debate section, if for me, I needed to address the doubts that I know people had about me. So mm -hmm. part of my setting up that I'm a director and I do all this stuff leads to the people, I know they are thinking, what the fuck you know about the brain? Right. Right? Actually, you, hold on, you said something cold. I like that part. When you was talking about, well, you studied it, and you know, you studied the research papers that came out, and then you hit them with, that's the fucking reason they published the papers in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was profound, because when you really think about it, people do that all the time, yeah. right? As if, the uh, only way to know something and to speak on something is for that to be your exact field of expertise, right? But studying is how we learn. Yep. Because even those scientists, and actually you get a, a greater ability because they published it, you don't have to do the work. Now you just get the expert information, right? So as long as I'm sourcing from the experts, you can take this as expert knowledge. Exactly. And then, and then in the TED Talk, the audience laughs. Yeah. So when they laugh, that topples any doubt. My, mm -hmm. I'm free to do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So after, after that debate section, and again, in every movie, they debate whether or not they're going to go on the adventure, right? Mm -hmm. But for, for what we're doing, you, you need to decide what, what debate do you need to, to have, right? When I do a, a treatment, my debate for me is actually just talking about the, I'm going to do this with the cameras, I'm going to do this with the wardrobe, right? So all the variables. Because now we're about to get into what the, in the second act, fun and games. All that stuff is a setup to actually now, now we're in the spaceship. Now we're, on the, now we're out and on the road. So there's two halves to the second act, okay? The first half, you go up the hill. So normally that's, you know, we're on the adventure, everything's going great, and then you hit the top, and they call that the bad guys close in. On, in the TED Talk, it's me talking about the studies. So the, the studies show. So let's apply it to what it's really all about, right? People who are prone to violent and aggressive behavior, the parts of their brain that are different than the average person, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that uh, is the decision-making part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that tells you, I'm alone in my bedroom, I can do these things. I'm in a restaurant, mm -hmm. I can't do those things, I can do these things. You right. feel what I'm saying? It's social interactions, the, rule, the rules, your understanding of the rules um, 
what do they call it, impulse control. Mm -hmm. That's the prefrontal cortex. For people that are prone to violence and aggression, their prefrontal cortex is smaller than the average person, it's mm -hmm. too small. Then the amygdala, the amygdala is uh, emotions, right? And their emotions are too big, okay? Um, I like to, you know, like your gut, big gut, mm -hmm. muscles too small. Okay, so for the, again, like I said, the average, the average person is a fair size, but that violent, aggressive brain, their emotions are too big, their decision making is too small, mm. okay? So I go through all those studies and I talk about those studies. Well, how do you get to that place? Well, children that are abused and neglected, and these are all separate studies that are all floating around. Right. What I did was bring them together for this conversation. So there's that study on violent and aggressive people, okay? Then there's another study over here that doesn't mention that at all. They just say children that are abused and neglected. So hitting your kid and ignoring your kid are the same thing. Mm. Children that are abused and neglected, their prefrontal cortex is smaller than the average person. Their amygdala is larger than the average person. Mm -hmm. There's a clear line to how you get there. Uh, in recent years, I found there's another set of studies that say stress changes your brain. Mm -hmm. Stress shrinks your prefrontal cortex and enlarges your amygdala, mm -hmm. right? And when, when that is going on for too long, it hardwires in your fight or flight response. You're just in it. You just, right. how many people do you know growing up right. that Im immediately it's on? Well, that's, that's also growing up in the hood and listening to certain music. When we listen to certain frequencies, we're in a low vibrational state. So that state is not that state where we have more control over self. Right, so if we listen to like binary beats of like 40 hertz, that's gonna put us in a state where we're less reactive, right? So if somebody step on your shoes, like, okay, it's cool, right? Versus when you listen to music and it's like, nah, knock these niggas down, I kill them, right? You in that state, like, bro, what's happening? So you automatically triggered and you tripping, and so you provoke and go straight to violence rather than rational thinking. So you're not getting any filter in your responses. Right, and so that's why it's dangerous. Like, people don't really think about, you know, their information diets and, and the environmental diets that they're supposed to take, right? To have the ability to decompress. It's like, we know that if we angry, you know, that's not the best time to go walk into a room full of people because you're short-tempered, right? So what you're talking about, if you're looking in the brain, you're not gonna have that much control over yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like you're not gonna be able to regulate focus to that prefrontal cortex, right, where that third eye is, and be able to say, you know what, I'm thinking higher right now. I have higher reasoning and skills at this moment, right? It, I know, like, therefore you can take that information and it will process. I know they didn't mean it like that, mm -hmm. right? I know this is not a problem, it's cool, I ain't even tripping, right? It takes you, 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 you almost jumped out that state, but you come right back down to your base level. You can see where it is, you can, you can do the steps. If I start this right. here, that leads to this, and the, you know what right. I mean? You're in Canada, it wouldn't be the smartest place to go get into a fight. Right. You may never be able to come back to Canada. Mm, yeah, that's a you, fact. You, you know what I'm saying? Tough, man. A lot so, of people couldn't make it out here. Exactly, I mean, yeah, I mean, all, the, all these things mean something, okay? So, there's another set of studies now that talks about meditation mm. and what meditation does to the brain. Meditation gives volume to your prefrontal cortex and shrinks your amygdala. Mm. The exact opposite of stress, which, or it's trauma, whatever you want to call it. The exact opposite of childhood abuse and neglect, right? The exact opposite of the violent and aggressive brain. So that's my first, that's going up the hill in the second act. Mm -hmm. Now I, I reached that midpoint. At my midpoint, I need to switch it up a bit. It needs to be related to what I went up for, right? But it needs to be a different flavor. So I hit the midpoint, and now it's time to tell you stories where meditation actually was effective. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the most violent prisons in Mexico, okay, they had a prison riot, and in that one riot, they killed 44 people. Mm -hmm. That's a high murder rate. If Toronto, if 44 people died in Toronto over the course of the year, that would be a bad year. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They did that in one riot, okay. So they started meditating, all the prisoners and all the guards. And after that, they did not have any more extreme violence. Right? Not a bad one. Mm -hmm. um, there is a school in San Francisco, a middle school. Again, one of the most violent neighborhoods in the city. Uh, 
one time the kids came to school and there were, I think, three dead bodies on the playground, mm -hmm. okay? So of course, that energy gets into the school. The kids are always fighting. It's just chaos in the school at all times. There's a, just the grades are bad. The violence is bad. The attendance is bad. They start a meditation program. Grades go up. Attendance goes up. Happiness goes up. Some of the worst performing students become their best performing students. Just the whole school environment changes. Yeah. Yeah. So that gets you to that, your, your final bit. Right? In, a, in, a, in a movie, what would normally happen is you go up, right? fun and games, then the bad guys close in. This would be the part where the big giant guy comes out the shadows and chases you around. You hit a low mark, which is that you know, someone normally dies. Okay? Uh, for us, in the TED Talk, it becomes, well, what are we going to do with this information? Right? And then you, your finale, and then the finale was bringing meditation to what the mission is of Operation Prefrontal Cortex. Mm -hmm bringing meditation into our schools, into the community, into the correctional system, um, and to the police, to the, our first responders, our police, and all them that deal in this high-stress high jobs, and let that react. Um, the TED Talk was really well achieved. When we put on Instagram, for about a good month, every time I left the house, someone would come up to me and say, yo, I saw the TED Talk. Did any of y'all in here see that TED Talk? Yeah. Um, and then we started getting real, like, unrelated uh, school in Malton, which is a kind of a city. Is Malton a city or is it like a so, town? Is it a town? Like, it has a sign that says, Welcome to Malton. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, but you, it's Malton's, it's, you never meet anyone from Malton outside of Malton. <laughs> Have you ever been somewhere and be like, someone say, I'm from Malton? Like, it just doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's a weird town. But, anyways, Malton. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love Malton, um, but it's, it's, a rough, it's a rough town. And um, they have really bad violence. And one of our largest shootings, 144 rounds in one shooting happened out there. And a, a young, young kid, Jonathan Davies, got killed. He was just waiting to get picked up by family, unrelated to anything that was going on. And it really hit that community hard. And one of the teachers, she has a program called GLE. Right, a leadership program, and she's want, she wanted to introduce meditation to the kids, and of course, a bunch of black kids in the hood are like, "Please, we meditate. What are you talking about?" So she used that TED talk to get them open to the idea, and seeing someone that looks like them, uh, again, what entertainment coming from the entertainment side, someone who works with people they look up to, it, it opened the door, and then when the science was presented, they said, "All right, we'll give it a shot." And then they started reaching out to, out to us like, yo, we're meditating, it's mm -hmm. different. It, it really, I, I feel better, I feel calm, I don't get angry the way I used to. Like it, it really impacted their lives. And we ended up making a documentary about them, mm -hmm. right? So the full circle is uh, we made a documentary called uh, Quiet Minds, Silent Streets. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it funded by Headspace. We're winning a lot of awards at different film festivals. Yeah. And now they are that piece of entertainment that I can use or we can use to show other kids and other people and have them say, oh. Right, some proof, some studies. I'll try that out. That, that's, that's interesting because, you know, you, you cited a lot of science and now I'm deep into science. I love psychology. I love the brain. You understand me? A lot of people, everybody has a brain, but everybody don't know how to use it, right? Like. We're not, we're not giving brain manuals and be like, yo, this is how this section work, this is how this section work. You know, like as you grow and as you age, the brain is gonna start to change, neurogenesis, white matter, all of that. These are not common terms that the average person knows or understands, right? We can talk about pop culture all day long and we're gonna have so much of that information from external world, but we don't have much of internal information from our internal world. Right, so therefore people lack the ability to control themselves because they don't have a control manual. You need those keys, right? And so most people don't know why they do things. Why am I always angry, right? So they don't know how to have that introspective, you know, observation to be like, yo, why am I feeling this way? And another thing about like, you know, mental health is brain health, but specifically like in correlation with your diet and how that changes the brain chemistry. Because we talk about mental health in our culture, but I think it's because 
you know, there's so many people that do talk about it, but they may be connected to sponsors who may have products that contribute to bad mental health, right? So it's like, let's just be honest, like alcohol is not good for the brain, right? But we can't talk mental health and sell alcohol at the same time. The reason you can't do that is because somebody who may follow you may have mental health issues, right? They may want to think positive, but then they may drink liquor, which is messing with their brain, right? And there are so many different things that we do, even from the foods that we eat that cause inflammation in the brain, right? And that inflammation becomes another reason why people can't think the same, right? It's like anytime we have inflammation within our body, that's our system attacking itself, right? And so this is what I find when I look at different people. Like you show me your diet, right? Tell me your, your history like a doctor would, and you can know what's wrong with a person. But the problem is most people have tactics, they ain't got strategies, right? So person feel like, man, I'm stressed, I'm about to smoke, right? So they go smoke some weed, that's a tactic, it's not a strategy, right? Because a strategy would take a holistic approach towards the root of the issue, taking a step back, figuring out why it was caused, not trying to figure out how to cover it up, but to figure out how to cure it. Right, so now you have a way of dealing with it anytime it starts to come. Right, so like one thing that meditation helps us to do, you know, you close your eyes and it allows you to focus on the inner or the outer, right? So most people are gonna say, you know, bring attention to your heart rate, right? So something called, what's it called? Um, introceptive, I believe. Like some people have a natural introceptive awareness of their internal self, right? Like, so like, one of the tests was to say, you know, see if you can count your heart rate without touching it. That's a representation that you are a person that has internal awareness a lot, right? So as you're talking to somebody, you may be feeling your gut, right? You may be thinking about how you feel, and this can be connected to social anxiety as well, right? You're talking to somebody and you can't stop thinking about how you look or something that's going on, right? Versus, you know, somebody who more so has extraceptive awareness and they're thinking about things outside, you know, their skin, right? And so these two different processes can determine the way you go about doing meditation, right? To balance it out. If you're a person that's overthinking too much on the inside, it can cause anxiety, right? You're overthinking, you're constantly processing what's happening. So you can't really be present and focused. Or if you're a person that ignores what's going on, you kind of detach from it, and your awareness is always outside of something that's going on. So you're not really aware of your internal processes. So if you're going to be doing meditation, one of them could be, I'm closing my eyes because I'm always thinking about my, or you keep your eyes open and you're sort of meditating to try to focus and have more awareness outside of self, right? Versus somebody that closed their eyes, and now they're bringing their attention to their third eye right here, that, prefrontal neocortex or that focus. And like when you close your eye, you can actually feel it, right? That's let you know you're doing it. And so that's a way for a person to be able to balance their states, right? And I think one thing that we don't get to do a lot in society is customize specific ways that human beings can enhance themselves. Because oftentimes when somebody figures out a technique, they tell you how they did it and you think it works for you as well, but you may be different. Right? And so you may be increasing your internal awareness, which could also increase your anxiety. So you have to know the tools and techniques that work for you in a customizable way. Because you could be increasing your mental health. So they like, or mental issues. So people be like, yo, I did everything you told me. You know what I'm saying? And it's still not working. So you gotta adjust your strategy. You gotta take a step back. Well, maybe I'm different. Maybe that doesn't work for me. Right? And I believe that. This is a problem we have with society, period. It's too generalized, it's not customized enough. Like when you talk about trauma, it's, I've, I've been through so many traumatic events and situations that it doesn't actually register and move me emotionally, right? Because I've become emotionally detached to trauma that happens in my environment. That's my response to it. A person gets shot at and it's hard for me to be like, <gasps> It's because I'm used to it. I grew up in Oakland and St. Louis. These are, growing up, these were two of the top murder capitals. You understand me? In the U.S. So growing up there, I've been shot at point blank range. People have tried to kill me for no reason. We didn't even know who they were. 
They were just sliding by trying to get some stripes, right? So I remember waking up in the night and my brother got shot, right? And so I, I've known before I was 20, probably like 20, 30, 40 people who died, right? And so the trauma response that we have, we get so conditioned and used to a traumatic reality that, you know, we think it's normal, right? And it's the same thing people get used to anxiety because they've never truly been in a state of calm, right? So they don't know what real, what being healthy even feels like. They just have coping mechanisms and tactics that allow them to continue to go with whatever their default state is. And so I think that that's a deep conversation because, you know, in the hoods of America, we got, and, and throughout the world, right, the same conditions that create one environment creates the other environment. Lack of proper nutrition, right? You know, lack of a, a good fostering environment, right? Like if you, you have ideas and you have nobody to talk to, right, you're deprived of naturally building out those interests and curiosities that you have. You, you, uh, you, you, you walked into an area, there's a sociologist named Emil Durkheim mm. in the early 1800s. He studied suicide. Mm -hmm. And he found that people who felt that they could not see dreams coming true. They could not see, when they looked at their life, mm. they couldn't see it going anywhere that they wanted to be, right? The wife, kids, they just, there's nothing there for them. That's what drove people to want to hurt themselves or hurt other people. Mm. And that's what we see going on. I mean, we see it all the time, right? When you really get into what these kids, you know, you're broke in the hood, what do you see ahead of you? Right. Beyond your, you got your hip hop dream, and maybe you're not even the rapper, maybe it's your boy. So then what is it? You know what I mean? And that, that anger, it, it, it can twist you. Mm -hmm. And when you look on the other side, right, those, that, that right wing, that angry right wing mad at the world, you know, imagine that in a trailer park in the middle of America. What do you, where do you see this all going? The factory is closed, maybe you're addicted to the, all, and that, that hopelessness leads to a, a want to hurt yourself or others. But he found the places that had community, places where the people could come together, mm -hmm. they could overcome that hopeless feeling. They could, they could get, they could get, ah, oh, well, that ain't happening, but what are you doing? What are you doing tonight? Let's go do, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That, that camaraderie, that, that community is what got people through. Right. The social cues and, and being around, like that, that's what happens, you know, like if you lose someone, right, you have to replace things with balance, right? Because now your body is still craving that energy and that presence. Right, so oftentimes if a person wants to lose a loved one, they go into depression, right? Because they may roll over and that person not there. And so now their body is, is off tilt, right? So instead they have to figure out how do I do something that can make up for what I lost, right? So that's why a person can get rid of a habit and go into depression, right? It's not the fact that that habit, you know, was good for you. It's the fact that you didn't replace it with something else to give your body balance. Right, so a person, man, I, I stopped drinking or I stopped smoking or I stopped doing whatever and you didn't replace it with another regiment, you go back to it because you feel like, man, I don't feel better, mm -hmm. right? And so I think about that anytime I want to change a habit of myself, I have to think, what am I going to exchange this habit for though? I can't just get rid of it, right? I have to put something else in that space, mm -hmm. right? So I think about life as, you know, like the Ma'at scale, you, you, it has to be weighed. This is a bad habit, now let me praise it with a good habit so I can keep my balance in life. Otherwise, it tips the scale. I would have been better off maintaining that bad habit, right? And so that's another important thing for people to understand because it, it helps them understand why it's hard for them to change, right? These are these internal things that's going on with us and it's hard for people to take that step back sometime and be like, yo, what's the why, right? People can often understand what, you understand me? And then, also, when we talk to people, we ask, how you doing, right? We don't have real languages that allow people to have internal conversations and introspection. If I was to meet you, I'd be like, hey, what you feeling today, right? Let's go change your response. Like, what am I feeling? 
So now it makes you have this internal perception of where your energy is, where your emotions, and then you're like, wait a minute, why am I feeling like this? Right? You become aware, and in that awareness, you can actually eliminate that emotion instead of reactively acting off of it. So they talk about the towing your stub, your, 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 you, if you uh, snub your uh, toe in the morning, then it reacts throughout the day. But it doesn't have to. If you stop right there and you process, you're like, that happened. Now move forward. If you don't, that emotional state stays, right? And then it compounds every other time you don't process. So now by the end of the day, you are angry for no reason, right? And so we take on too many emotions and we stack them, right? We take on so many issues and we stack them and then we got all this anxiety, right? For me, I step out of the eye of the storm. When there's too much going on, I step away. And my stepping away is the mindfulness. Like, I must, like, I have a deep internal conversation always happening. I'm always deeply aware of my internal processes. Too much sometimes, right? But at the same time, it's my gift because I can hear myself very, very clear. And this allows me to communicate because I'm practicing my thoughts before I speak, right? So therefore, and then I have a deep internal vision I can see what I say before I say it, so it's like a subtitle screen that I get to read, right? And I've learned to hone in on these practices to make me better at being a human being. This is how I direct myself throughout life, right? And so a lot of us, we accept our weaknesses, right? We accept that this is just my default. When we know through neurogenesis and through, you know, training the mind and the brain, we can actually change our states of mind. Right, we can go from beta or delta to where it's low sleep state, where it's just a state of suggestion, to gamma, to where we're super aware, right? And we actually do this throughout our days. We have cycles throughout the days where we're more aware at certain parts of the days, and then that work feels like it's anxiety, and that's when you take a rest. So in the hoods of America, you don't really get a rest. You don't get a walk. You don't get a, I get to go to the, I get to take a vacation to Dubai for a second, then I come back and deal with the hood politics. Right. No, poverty is 24-7. When you learn how to use your mind, that's when you start to operate the system body. You start to tap into your God body. That's when you operate and learn how to take your thoughts and form them into reality. That's when you pull things from the darkness and you bring it into light into reality. And that's when you have the power to change the world and you can bring wealth into generations into your family. There's power that's going on, why don't you go grab it? There's crowns out here, why don't you put your hand on? There's a lot of people on you, why don't you knock it down and slap the devil and tell him it's your time? What we waiting for? I'm ready to go to the highest level. If you're ready to come rock with us, if you're ready to build with us, because we're not waiting on nobody. Once we get on the mission, we in motion, we devote it, we get liberation to our people. Our freedom ain't talking about the identity that's connected to the evils that the agenda gives you. No, we're talking about actually knowing that you got and staying tall and speaking to the power against all odds. They look at me and say, how's you a black man? How you walking, how you talking, how you dressing, how you moving, how you moving? Why you know yourself so much? Why you so damn cool? Why you got confidence? Because I decided that I would never live at the lowest level. That's the same. I decided I would live down. Where does he go down? I don't want to train. We're going to the highest level. Make sure y'all come with us. The highest level tour is, you know, it's, it's a moment in, in history that we get to think about and relish in and be a part of. This is me proving my thought leadership. This is me implementing the ideas and reinvigorating the spirit that we're going to need to win the future right now. What you're saying about brainwaves is actually interesting. It's a good segue. Mm -hmm. um, the meditation I do is called the Silva Method. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, you familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Right. So the Silva Method, he came up with this, Jose Silva came up with this in the 50s or the 60s. 
He first called it Silver Mind Control. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he changed the name because mind control had negative connotations after MK Ultra. That's yeah, another yeah. thing we're going to talk about. No, we can talk we about that. that. Another, that's another, you know what I'm saying? But, um, it's another segue. It's another segue. But, so his whole thing was that the universe uh, resonates in the alpha state. Mm -hmm. And if you can bring your brain down through meditation into the alpha state, and then you begin to visualize your goals, that it's a bit of a cheat code. It's like you're... Yeah, <laughs> it's like you're dropping in, you drop yeah. it in through for the for the universe to, to manifest, and that was the meditation that I started doing. One to see, you know, a bit of a science experiment. Let's see if I can manifest what I want to manifest. Mm -hmm. But in it, I found a, a a meditation that is calming, but still active. It's not like yeah, just clear your brain and. You know, listen to the no, no. It's it's yeah. it's it's something where you're you're doing something, but it still takes you to that place. And then when you get to that place, you begin to visualize what you want to do with yourself and seeing yourself achieve it, right? And you know, we can debate whether or not that interacts with the universe and makes it manifest, or if that just helps focus what you want to do with yourself. But I've, I've found I found it both. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Speaking of the CIA, right? CIA talked about patterning. And patterning is a technique of emotional, intellectual, you know, visualization, right? So the idea is that if you constantly focus and create a visualization of the exact reality that you want to live, right, you project a hologram, right? And because the universe is a hologram and thoughts have an energy signature, you can project that hologram into the universe and create it, right? Now, they have a whole entire science paper on this, right? And it sounds as if a yogi would have wrote it, right? But it's interesting because when science, you know, science is a bit of a religion itself, right? But people don't look at it like that. Science is more set as a matter of fact in stone. You're now got the Bible of results. Right? When reality, science is always changing because they told us that our brain couldn't change at first. And then we find out that was crap completely. Right? And what we really found out is that you have to stimulate the brain differently. Right? So after the ages of like 25, your brain has to be stimulated from the hippocampus area that regulates mood, memory, and learning. You have to do different things. Right? So when you were younger, you have great pattern recognition. You can just learn, learn, learn. Then when you get older, information ain't hitting like that. Right? And so people feel like they start to get old when they have these neurodegenerative re declines, right? Because of the way we start to live. We start to overtake chemicals, things of that nature. So that destroys our ability to have control over ourselves and our reality, right? So your ability to emit consciousness and, and holographic projections in the universe might not be working like that. So I might be giving you the game, but you know, you got a lot of mercury in your system and you got a lot of chemicals in your system, right? And so therefore your powers ain't working, right? So my powers be working, I ain't gonna lie. I clean you know, it up. I, you know, another, another thing, I, someone sent me something not long ago. Yeah. The same parts of your brain that respond to a physical attack, mm -hmm. which is again your prefrontal cortex yeah. and your amygdala, are the same parts of your brain that react to new information. Mm. So when you talk to someone, you hit them with like, oh, yeah, that thing truth. you think, that thing you think ain't yeah. the thing that is, mm -hmm. and that that aggressive yeah. defense yeah. of the thing they think it is, mm -hmm. that's actually the brain. That's how the brain reacts to new information. That's why I call it a truth bomb, man. Mm -hmm. it, it, truth, truth is an electrical energy. It can change literally. You can be presented with such a powerful truth that it changes the whole state of your brain matter. It rearranges. Right, your neurons. This one is no longer, you gotta, oh snap, I gotta disconnect this one, put it over here. That was wrong, my bad. Yeah. Like nowadays they talk about woke, right? And woke has been a hijacked term to mean whatever fill in the blank you wanted to for a derogative term. So instead of saying the derogative term that they mean, they say it's woke, right? But when the beginning of it came about, it was about awareness. Right, and being aware of reality. And so there was all these documentaries came out or there were master teachers throughout time that would give us information that would shock our system. Like, wait a minute, that's happening? Right, and some people can actually go crazy from this. It can be too much, right? Like, if, if, that's why it was the whole concept in the matrix. You can't unplug everybody. You have to bring them to a certain level of awareness first, 
right? Because when we unplug them, it will shock them. And the shocking truth can kill you, right? So it's like, I was talking earlier, I said Donald Trump was actually, he made a lot of white middle America woke. Right, and the reason I say that is because he started hitting people with terms like fake news. So somebody who wholeheartedly accepted an idea, who never really thought to ever question the media, has now been hitting with this shell of truth, right, that some of these things are fake. Like, and he started breaking down, like, no, you know, they work for this, they not here. So he was there, you know, uh, um, they already, they, they compared him to too many recent black people. I can't compare him to no black people right now. They talking about he was- oh, they, they got walk wild. Yeah, they got they was going wild, wild, so I'm not going to give him that. Yeah, yeah. But he was their woke messenger, I would say that, right? He, so this is why he has such a strong base, because they now have a core memory and a connection, right, to their Lord and Savior that gave them this new wokeness. You know, the funny thing, it was Hillary who first coined the term, and then he took it from her. Mm. I remember that clearly. Yeah. She, yeah, I, I know if you go in your brain, you kind of remember Hillary's kind of, yeah, it's fake news. And he just snatched the term. Mm, he heard that. <laughs> Ooh, fake he news. just took it from her. He just took it from her and fake made it news. his. Thank yeah. you. Oh, uh, he played her every so it was hilarious. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, that's powerful though. Like, and this is why it makes it hard for people to accept truths, right? Like you can present somebody with a truth and then there's a cognitive bias, right? Because people are trying to protect who they are. You, you, you go your whole entire life building up who you are, and you're trying to protect this because you believe this is all I have. If I let this go, I don't know if I'm still going to love what I love. I don't know if I still want to do what I do. I don't want to know too much. Don't tell me because maybe I can't, I can't be with this person, right? I can't work this job. Maybe they went too hard on being right about this thing. Right. If they, they, it's going to, this is, man, we came out of COVID. People went real hard on their yeah. opinions. Yeah. And then they, they just, you know, that, just don't have, they just dip out the room when they're, oh, I was wrong. Right. That's <laughs> yeah. why you have to be in a state of readiness to constantly accept new truths, right? You can have a rigid truth in your mind, and that's completely fine. But the, your religion should be truth, right? So you can't have and say, oh, I believe in this, but I can't hear that just in case it destroys this truth. A superior knowledge does not submit to inferior knowledge. Right, so if it's superior, it can stand up to the test of time. Right, I've done that throughout my whole life, testing whether the knowledge that I was taught, right, from when I was young was indoctrination or it was real truth. And most people are afraid to go on that journey because they don't know who they will become afterwards. Well, the, the people, people get real, again, we're talking about the brain. The brain likes things the way it is. Mm -hmm. People come in trying to move the furniture around. They're like, yo, ooh, ooh. You right. know what I'm saying? That's where that, that, that couch goes there, Right. you know? And, and we saw it, and I really, I really saw over the past few years, just the politics, the pandemic, just a lot of things that they'll, they'll let the thing burn. I don't know if you ever, it was like a behavior when you're young. You, you, something was wrong and you left it wrong. You know what I'm saying? It, it felt like addressing it would be a bigger right, thing. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? And as a child, you're like, okay, I can get that. But now I'm seeing like, no, this is, Adults, right. governments, mm -hmm. don't want to admit that they're wrong about something. Mm -hmm. So they just publish the papers and see who reads it. it just they'll just yeah, exactly. you know what I mean? they'll just they'll no, just. We got to admit, look, we, we dropped it. the file. We didn't let nobody know, but you know this is where we admit it. If you want to read them 500 pages real quick, yeah, it's somewhere in the middle of page 250, but we ain't gonna tell you. Yeah, <laughs> brother, just stay way of admitting the truth. You know what I'm saying? But I, I think it's very powerful conversation because. And the, you know, uh, hoods of the world and not even just the hoods, you can be a corporate person and you could be telling yourself the reason that you're doing this thing is because, you know, it's who you are, right? And most people never know who they are. They know what they do, right? But if I ask you who you are, I get slow responses from everybody. If I ask you what you do, it's quick, right? Because what you do is reactive. It can be reactive to your circumstances in life. I needed money, right? I can ask you why you with the person you with. You may not be able to tell me, right? It could have just been reactive. I was feeling lonely, right? So most people don't have a philosophy of life. I do this because it's connected to my purpose. I love what I do and they can go deeper and draw more inferences and connections and they just light up like, yo, this is why I'm doing this. I love this like it's crazy. That's not the state that most people live in. 
And especially in the hood, we're in a constant frantic state of panic and low vibration, bad food, dehydration. We're not eating right. We're not drinking right, right? We're constantly over police. There's sirens, there's issues, there's news. And so even when you hear- And then you gotta make a living amongst all you gotta make a living. So you're in a constant state of survival. So you don't get to get to that point of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you get to actualization, where you can think about if I just had all the money in the world, what would I do then, right? What would I do that just gives me pure happiness? Most people never get to that place. Well, I mean, this is, again, this is why I bring back the meditation in Operation Prefrontal Cortex. This really is the one thing that doesn't cost any money that we can do. Even in your, whatever state you're in, mm -hmm. meditation and exercise, really the best way to look at it is exercising in the brain. Yeah. At least you're exercising. How often do you ex I mean, uh, meditate? I do it, I, I do it every morning. Um, I used to, you know, unless I got something crazy, I gotta go do, yeah. you know what I mean? But uh, at first when I was doing the silver method, I was doing 15 minutes. Then a friend of mine sent me a declassified CIA document. <laughs> uh oh, okay. Oh boy. You got so, some new techniques. Got some new techniques. So I'm in it, and this guy's like, oh, one man can, with mine can destroy an army. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, the CIA, the CIA really knows what's real. Yeah, you went full Jedi. I went full Jedi. Yeah. But let's, get, for, let's forget their political yeah. bull, bullshit. That science wing mm -hmm. of the CIA, they are not trying to uphold anything. They just want to know if it works. Right. So they got everything. They, mm -hmm. they got everything. So right. th this thing talks about meditation. If you meditate, they got big, you know what I mean? And in it, they call it hemisync. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Monroe. Right, uh, right. The Monroe, the Monroe tapes. Right, I go, oh. It's on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know I'm saying? Like all the tapes on YouTube. I downloaded it, so I've been doing that. So now my meditation is about half an hour. Yeah. And then I journal after that. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, it's just, again, it's a great way to start your day just visualizing yourself reaching your goals, you know, going all the way into like, yeah. you know, yeah. really, here's yeah. your goals and like double, double it. Right. It's, it's a great space to exist in and then go in out in the day. And like I said, what it does for your brain. Right, sinking those two hemispheres of your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time we either left or we right brain, right? So most people don't have that full control of your brain being in this balanced state. Right, and that's when you one of the ones. That's when you walking around like you Obi Wan Kenobi. You understand me? And you know, I think most people can tell sometimes. You you know, just being in a state of flow. Most people can't get into a state of flow, right? That state of flow is when you feel good and you're doing good, right? You can challenge me to anything, and that's when my my skills meets the challenge, right? To so where I can operate in a state of mastery no matter what, because my mind is in a constant state of flow. Right? And I want to, you know, I teach people about God consciousness, right? How to crystallize yourself into that higher consciousness to where when you find yourself in that state of flow, you can stay there. Because there's sometimes where you can have perfect recall. There's sometimes where you just get amazing ideas, right? Where you have that super intelligent agency that's happening in your mind. But why can't you always operate at that? The idea is, is that you can. Right, but you don't practice the habits. Sometimes you just get lucky and you're there, but you don't know how to reverse engineer to constantly bring it up. So it's like the masters, the billionaires of the world, they, they focus on these things. Because if they know that if they can control themselves, they can control the world, right? Like you cannot bring out your grand ideas into this world without having control over yourself, right? Because it's gonna require process and stages of development, right? Like, even some ideas, the person that come up with ideas is not the same person that can bring it to life, right? Along the journey of that idea, you have to become more in order to finish that idea into reality, right? So you may have come up with a movie idea, and this movie idea was nice, but are you the person that can go network, right, and go talk to the people you need to talk to because you may not have social skills. So you may have been introverted, oh, I got this great idea, and they're like, well, can you go pitch it? And you're like, damn, I got to learn a whole new skill to get to my next stage. Now you didn't got to the pitch, but now can you be uh, organized? Can you actually be a project manager? Do you think that all the people you need are around you? If you, you're that kid, you have, you have your idea. Do you think the universe is actually placed around you? Because for me, 
Mm. It has placed the people around me mm. that I need. I, I've, 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 the, the, the people that are truly outside of my circle, someone in my circle brought them, you know what I'm saying? And I wonder if that, I look at Drake, his people were around him. His, his things really started rolling when he yeah. just said, you know what, let me bring my people in. You know what I mean? Um, and I wonder, how, what do you think? Do you think? Do you think for that kid who doesn't have the social skills, amongst, not all their friends, but am, amongst their friends is the one they need that has the social skills, but has the sense, you know what I mean? I think so. I definitely think so, like, I look at my own team and they can do things that I can't do, right? Sometimes you don't develop the vision to be able to use each other, right? So y'all may be friends because y'all go to the club or go to the party and not realize that each one of you all have a skill that can help each other in the area that you're weak in. And so that becomes the yin-yang relationship, which is often why we connect with people in our lives in the first place, right? People talk about people completing them. Right, and it's not that they complete you like you're not enough, it's that they add on to what you don't have. We become extensions of the people around us. I wonder, is it, we're all, we're all, we're all buzzing at a frequency, right? And there's a harmony when, you, when the frequencies are right. And I wonder if you got a group of friends Oh, each, for sure. Each, each one's a different key, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Literally a different key Absolutely. into the thing. And if that harmony is right, then that's, there's a reason, you know what I'm saying? We see that in dynamic duos all the time, right? When, when one person's like, you know, you may, it's like the good cop, bad cop scenario, right? You're more aggressive, they're more relaxed, but that's what makes the balance in the situation, right? Because when, when this person is going above and super aggressive, this person's more relaxed in the situation and not be too crazy, right? And I think that that's why, like I said, that's, that's the completion of the frequencies that compete each other. It was Dr. West, he talked about the Black Guy Protocol, and his idea was the fact that we are all frequencies, right? In the universe, there's just spectrums of frequency, and each frequency is different, right? But you have a frequency of something in you that I can't do. So that forces me to bow down to the mastery of self that you complete, right? But together, when you add those frequencies, that's the universe, right? And so we're not, we was never all supposed to be the same. Otherwise, it wouldn't bring any unique point of value, right? If everybody's just like me, there's no need for me, right? But since people are different, everybody can't communicate. Everybody can't think, right? So therefore, my skill sets benefit other people, right? And then they have skill sets that benefit me. And I think what we lack sometimes is the ability to appreciate the value that each one of us have. Right, and so oftentimes we start looking at the skill sets that somebody else has. We start looking at the way that they wear their strengths and we want those results, right? But that's not our strengths, right? So I, I always talk about the fact that people sometimes have dreams that's connected to their weaknesses because you watch somebody else build out a dream on their strengths and you want those same results. But it's about the middle, it's not about the end. The middle is who that person is. The end is the results of being that person. Right, and so we watch the end, right? He got the movie, he did the thing with Drake, he did the thing with the big pimp, and I want that too. You watching the end. No, the middle was who he was that produced that reality. Yeah. Right, so, you know, you, you can't even appreciate the end of the movie until you know what happened in the middle. You know what I'm saying? And so most people don't know nothing about the process in the middle, yet they want the ending. And it's like, you don't even deserve it, right? And so. I try to get people to think about that customization for that purpose and the power of mental visualization of sitting down, thinking about what you want to customize your life as is a very powerful tool when you're talking about transcendental meditation. Because for me, I'm gonna either meditate to clear my mind or I'm gonna meditate to think about something, right? I'm gonna meditate to bring complete focus in an area so that I can be in a state of flow when I go do things, right? Oftentimes, I, like before speech, I'll be getting ready and I study all these things that allow me to create these connections, right? Identify my central thing, right? Identify the analogies and the stories that I want to tell because as you're speaking, you're building up an idea, right? In someone else's head. So you're transferring a vision, right? So I have a vision of a red dot in my head. So now everybody else that just thought about it, they got a red dot in their head, 
right? So this red dot is expanding right now. And there there's a, a black dot in the middle of this red dot. That's what talking is, right? We're communicating ideas that people can build up. So now it's not in my head, it's in your head, it's yours now. So now at the end of this TED Talk of life, you can walk away, right, with what I had in my head. I just passed it along, right? And so that's my daily on how you inspire. I can walk a certain way. By visualizing me, we have mirror neurons. We mirror what we see, right? Human beings love to follow the crowd because we feel more protected in a swath of numbers. And we often sacrifice our genius just to be a part of something. So assimilation destroys individual uniqueness. But individual uniqueness and overthinking about your individual thought process can take away your ability to add to the collective because you want everything to revolve around you versus what can I add? You understand me? And instead, people try to compete. Oh, he do the direct. I bet I can do directing too. Like, no, <laughs> you could have found a job on set to help, right? And so we watch people that are successful and try to figure out how we can compete with them instead of collaborate, mm -hmm. right? And now we can be complementary, right, instead of competitive. And that's a better nature of human beings because that's when we build great pyramids, right? That's when we build great systems or when my strengths are complementary to yours. And then we can start advancing societies and nations, right? And so. Unfortunately, when we leave circumstances that we came from, right, like the hoods, we don't get to go back and complement that environment to become better and pass on the skill sets and the strengths to say, I'm going to add to this to grow it, right? And I understand because once you escape something, you don't want to go back, right? It's like, why would I go back to the scene of the crime? This is where my trauma started, right? I've done the test, the, the adverse childhood experience test, and I've ranked very high because I've had almost every adverse childhood experience you could think of, but I've learned the quality of self-forgiveness, right? Gratitude and grace, right? I practiced going back in my childhood at points in time, like you said, a child at that time, they couldn't understand that experience. It happened to them. They didn't create the reality. But as an adult, you get to go back, understand it, and rewrite the emotion attached to it. So now you get to practice detachment. So now you're not constantly refilling that feeling every time somebody brings it up, right? If a person says, you know, my ex, all of a sudden people are triggered, <laughs> right? Because they never processed that, right? But if you processed it, that don't mean nothing to you. It's nothing. Speaking of, I got a segue. How did you get the X? Director X? I mean, it, start, it started- Dr. X, all good. Right. I mean, that. Well, you sound like a doctor today. Right. Um, back in the, the early 90s, mid 90s, hip hop was a very different scene. Mm -hmm. You know, even, in, even if you're a gangster rapper or, a, you know, rapping for the girls, yeah. everyone had their black conscious song. Yeah. And then there's groups, the whole thing was being black and conscious. So X Clan, mm. uh, Public Enemy, yeah. Paris, this is this is a big part of the thing. So this is when everyone's about Malcolm X and you know what I'm saying? Um, so being uh, the light skinned nigga that I was, I was the blackest <laughs> motherfucker in the room constantly. <laughs> hey man, shout out to light skinned people. Stop the rebel, look at the guns. <laughs> y'all gotta, y'all be light on the outside, but black, we're, we're very dark on the inside. It's always, yeah, exactly. It's always, it's always, always the lightest guy. It's like, yeah. we gonna kill these crackers. That's <laughs> that internal melody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, of course, they started calling me Little X. Okay. Right? Um, so that was it. I liked it. So Little X. So you took on X. Malcolm Little and Malcolm I, I brought them both together. <laughs> but interestingly, I remember I liked the X name. It just sounded, it was cool. Right. I wanted the X name. And I remember walking to school thinking about like an X name. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a black youth conference and they're like, you're a Little X. Mm. Like the, they said it to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then I just would draw it on, when I would draw, I'd start writing Little X. Like I'd draw a character and put mm -hmm. a shirt. I used, it was, you know, I was an artist. Um, oh, I used to draw a lot more, let's say that. Um, and then when I started directing, well, actually I was doing poetry. I did spoken word, okay. used little X. Yeah. Then I, then I started directing, used little X. And then when I hit my 30s, being little X didn't feel quite like mm. I'm a grown yeah, man. Yeah, I no, can no, run no. around with a little, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, so then it became director X. And it has the, 
Yeah. Has the right power to it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sounds strong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sounds like the guy that gives you your mission in the movie. Yeah, Director yeah. X. Yeah. You know what I mean? You sound like a, a Marvel character. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I like that. So, speaking of movies, right? Superfly. I remember my father was telling me about when Superfly came out, the original one, right, in the 70s, and how it changed the game, right? Because it exported, right, um, a certain type of, you know, um, pimpology. And at the same time, black exploitation and political consciousness around the world, right? But it also made a certain type of black man more popular, right? The flamboyant pimp, right? And so watching the new film was an interesting new take on, you know, this new era of, of where we at, right? Because that was a different type of masculinity, right? Coming from the 60s, it was very militant, structurized, right? And then going into the 70s, you started to see a change in style, fashion, right? Social interactions, the way we treated each other. And then that movie was shown to the culture and it sort of changed the, 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 the not changed, but it influenced, right? you know, the way black men uh, dressed, the way that they talked, right? And it made them want to be pimps as well, right? So in doing Superfly, did you take in any of that account as far as like the cultural history that's connected to it? Yeah, I looked at the original movie and I wanted to hit, because to me the mission was remaking Superfly, mm -hmm. right? So I, I thought of it like Hood Shakespeare, Yeah. right? So if you're doing Romeo and Juliet, it's got to be two people from different sides of town, two mm. sides that don't get along, yeah. um, uh, curse on both your houses when someone gets, you, you know, yeah. and then the tragic ending. Mm. So I took the key elements of Superfly, which to me, one, is, one was the hair, mm -hmm. the friend, like all, all those yeah. elements. So if you watch the original Superfly to mine, I brought back all the original characters, mm. the, all their story arcs are essentially the same. Even when I changed some things, like in the original Superfly, he gets attacked by two junkies. Mm. And that's what makes him say, I want to get out the game. If, uh, and he wanted a million dollars. Now, if you're in the streets and you're gonna leave the game, a million dollars ain't enough. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about making that kind of score, you're not interacting with junkies anymore. Mm -hmm. So we said, oh, okay, well, it was, he, he left, the, it was people in the game that made him want to leave. So that's why we made it rival drug dealers, mm. right? I didn't want to make something, I didn't want to make a movie that the hood would watch and be like, you know what? Yeah. We got to turn this shit up. We yeah. ain't, you know what I mean? Uh, so there's a, <laughs> listen, we ain't man. doing good enough. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. You remember when The Wire came out? Yeah. Yeah, we were like, you know what? We got to, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting point because most of the movies are made so aspirational that you want to be the characters in the movie. Yeah. You don't really get the lessons that the character got from the movie. No, they just see the, the, right, cool, the they just see the, the, the well, I mean, there's, some, there's something in, we are animals, mm -hmm. right? And there is a part of you that wants to exact revenge. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You have these, and you, you can turn that up with a movie. You know, you know, you know how this goes. So I just didn't want to make, you know, I got an organization trying to stop gun violence. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make a movie that would, kids would watch and say, that looks like my neighborhood. Mm. That looks like my life. I, this is giving me ideas, right. right? It was, it's John Wick for black folks. It's, right. it's uh, why can't we have an action movie unrelated to the real world? Man, you know what? I, I've always thought about starring in one like that. Some <laughs> <laughs> ideas, but you know, because I always thought about the fact that I, t I get tired of watching movies about my reality, right? It's like, I, I don't need to watch the movie. I can walk outside. Exactly. Like, I'm tired of seeing that because it's like a reinforcing social conditioning that this is your reality. Exactly. Instead, I want to see some sci-fi. I want to see some thrillers, right? I want to see things completely different than what I experienced because that taps into the imagination. Right, that's, that's the fantasy industry as my brother Red Pill calls it, right? Yeah. You can really promote change through movies. And as you talked about, you know, there's techniques that can evoke, you know, to make this character more aspirational and traits of this character, right? Like in Superfly, he was a smooth dude, right? Considered to be masculine, 
right? But it was also the type of masculine that wasn't hyper masculine. But if you tried him, you feel me? He can whoop you because he had hands. Mm -hmm. Then he had the multiple women. So he was the alpha male, the one that everybody wants to be, right? So in the original Superfly, when you see the pimp with the ladies, that's what I want to be. So that character of the pimp was sold as the new masculinity to the world. And I think people don't understand, and this is what I kind of want to get at, is like the consciousness that you have to filter the movies when you watch them, right? Like my parents always gave us that third eye of, you know, this is, like you can watch what you want, but like this is how you think about it. So that you're not internally being influenced, right? Subconsciously, because you don't realize it. And most people watch movies for entertainment, which is the greatest state of suggestion, right? A, a movie has a central theme and an idea that it wants to convey, right? And so you may not realize it, but it's conveying an idea and communicating to you. And by the time you leave, you leave with that idea, right? And that now becomes a part of you, right? And that can now showcase in some of your social behaviors, the way you dress, the way you move. You want to be that character because you just watch this person for two hours straight, right? And watching things for that long, like we don't watch nobody for that long. Right, we now have it, this is why influencers work so well because when you watch a person over and over and over, right, it becomes connected to your own self-identity because there's an image of them in you, right? Like this is who you see. So it's very, you have to be very careful of what you watch. So like, what are, I mean, it's two directions I can go. You know what I'm saying? I was gonna ask you like, you know, what movie you want me to star in? But I think, you know, I, I could go somewhere different, right? You just let you think. It's just art of suggestion. Um, how, how do movies work sometimes? Like, or what movie have you seen where you can see a blatant, like, storyline that's suggesting something, right? Like, how does that go about if you want this character to be, like, the main one that's cared about, even if he's not the main character? So it's like, let's say uh, Black Panther, right? Everybody liked Michael B. Jordan character more than Chad Boswick because the anti-hero is more relatable, they're more complex. I was talking to Joey Badass about this, right? You know, we have a lot of anti-heroes in a culture, right? Because we do a lot of crime dramas and things of that nature. So how does that go? What's the psychology? What's the, what's the secrets of the trade? I mean, the, that book I mentioned earlier, Save the Cat, mm -hmm. literally mentions that that's what that's about. In Superfly, when that girl gets shot and he slides over and gives her money, mm -hmm. it makes you oh, he's a good guy. Yeah. That's his save the cat moment. Mm. You know what I mean? You have, to, you have to give the character you want to have some empathy for, the one mm -hmm. you want the people to root for, yeah. you got to give them something, give them something that they do that makes the audience right. say, that's a good guy. Yeah. I like that one. Um, I mean, and then there's just the, the thing about playing the villain it's just they just get to really release, right? Because yeah. the, the whole point of the good guy is what we've been talking about. Right. Control. Right. They, they have control of themselves and the situation and they take control. Control very much is, and you know, sometimes control isn't the most fun, mm -hmm. right? The, the bad guy, the whole point is they have no control. Right. Right. And they get, to, they get to do, so even in the performance, they get to give the bigger performance and do the wilder thing. and. You know, it's just a, it's a different kind of role to eat up. You remember, like, Die Hard? Yeah. That villain was great. There's a great, to be a truly great movie, you need a great villain. That's a fact. Right? You know, I think fails at making good villains, DC. They never give their villains any characters. No complexity. They just show up to get killed. You know? Marvel, you relate to the character. Right, because this character has a, a, a beginning, a tragedy, right, to where you can feel sorry for them. So you started to, because usually with villains, is, is the empathy is employed through tragedy, right? Like, oh, this is how they became the way they are. It's not really their fault, right? And they get to let out all of the innate dark human desires, right? And human nature relates to that. Like, oh, if I wasn't in control of myself, I'd probably be like that too. Well, the, the, villains, the villains in Marvel all have a point to a point you're like, maybe they're right, mm. right? Right. Thanos was, you know, we're using up all the resources. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just get rid of half the people. Right. You know, uh, Michael B. Jordan's character, Killmonger, mm -hmm. was why are we, we have all this technology, why are we playing nice with these motherfuckers? Killmonger was a hero. Right? 
So, but that's what I'm saying. They, they, represent, they represent a part of ourselves where, you know, there's a part of your brain that says you should hurt that person. Mm -hmm. That's a, the solution in this scenario is hurting, and you feel it. Mm -hmm. Someone's talking bad about you, or someone's just getting in your way, or you know, someone's just been mean to you, and they're not even thinking about you anymore. Mm -hmm. you, there's a part of you that wants to, to do what they did to you, mm -hmm. to, to return that feeling, mm -hmm. right? But in reality, hurting that person, now you start a chain of events. Mm -hmm. And the smarter play is to go live life better, yeah. right? It's a, it will be better for you in the long run. And that's what these movies are supposed to be doing. I tell kids when I speak to different uh, film groups that a movie has to do two things. You're either talking about the world and how to move through the world, or, or that's it. You're either talking about the world or how you move through the world, mm. those two things. And if you're not making a statement about those two things, then you're wasting time, which is why the Fast and Furious movies are a great time. Mm -hmm. But they're not saying anything. They're not saying truly anything right. about, you know, family, family, family. But even that, they're just saying those words. Right. You don't come out of those movies truly touched right. and, and moved and really see that, okay, I see what you're trying to say about the world. Where Star Wars, the reason why Star Wars has meant so much to so many people, mm. that talk of the force, mm -hmm. that there's this, there's this force, there's this thing around us. And if you know how it's moving things around all the time, and if you get in tune with it, then you can move things too. And then you can just talk to someone and they'll just follow a command and you right. can just move things without touching it. And it's, it's this analogy for what we all know, we have that feeling that that's how the world works, the matrix. Right. That's why people, you know, these are not just movies, they're essentially novels to themselves. There's, you, you can't really move through the modern world and not, even if you've never watched Star Wars or the Matrix, you have some kind of idea right. of how that works. You know what I mean? These are like essential books that you, you need to read. And that's truly what storytelling is supposed to do. Right? And of course, people do spectacle, and you find, I find that with the DC movies too. They're just kind of, hey, people are right. punching and they're flying, and there's a bad guy, and he looks evil. And you okay, watch it just to watch it because it's what you go get. Yeah, and, and it's over, but it, it doesn't stay with you. But that's mm -hmm. the, that is what storytelling has always been meant to do, down from the fairy tales Hansel and Gretel, uh, little, you know, uh, little Red Riding Hood. These mm -hmm. are all these little morals that are trying to get into you a way of the way the world works, right? Stay away from strangers. Mm -hmm. Don't take things that, you know what I mean? These, these things keep coming up. These are, are supposed to be lessons. And if that's, not, if that's not there, if you don't have something you need to say about the world, then, again, you're not saying nothing. Mm. What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Hmm. I mean, the kid in me, I remember, the Terminator 2 blew my mind away. Mm. Empire Strikes Back blew my mind away. Mm. The older, the older me loves me Godfather 2, or watching one and two as one whole, yeah. one whole thing. Uh, recently, Everything Everywhere All at Once. That's a good movie right there. Bro. Good movie, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's masterful on, a, on all the levels. Yeah. Masterful storytelling, right. saying, talking about family, right. trauma, history, and then on top of that, it's a kung fu movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I talked about that. It's like one of the first movies. It's, it's starring Asian characters, but it's not an Asian film, right? It's like those characters could have been replaced with black or white or anybody else, and I think that's what made it a really good film because it was about the theme, you understand me, rather than the people. And it's like you see the, the show um, The Last Man Who Fell to Earth, right? That movie had no context to their race. It was just a good show about, you know, science, right? And this Anunnaki alien, and it was great, and it was refreshing to see something that wasn't always planned on this low-level self-awareness of, well, of consciousness. What, what, what we have not done, we all grew up, especially, again, I, I'm born in 75. You got, it was white people. Mm -hmm. that, that TV was a bunch of white people and one black friend, mm. right? And that's what it was. Yeah. If, if that. Right. Sometimes a black friend wasn't there. Yeah. Right? I, was, I do remember uh, Ghostbusters. One of the Ghostbusters movies came out and they had the cover of some magazine in 7-Eleven and it was a fold out, right? 
so on the main cover, it was the three white characters. And then when you folded it out, guess who was on the fold out? Yeah, the one, the one black, the one, the, the black. They literally folded him of it. <laughs> but, um, but that was what it was. So it's just white people doing, making their movie. It's about the character. And at no point did they make it about being white. The, mm -hmm. the, right. None of that shit was, it was just the characters existing. And we all had to watch it and put ourselves, we all saw ourselves in Star right, Wars. Right, right. We all saw ourselves in Terminator. We saw, you know what I'm saying? We just had, that was the choice. Mm -hmm. You know, white, white folks are a bit of a blank slate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just right. put yourself on it. And the whole world went with it because it wasn't about a thing. And we often make our movies about the struggle, mm -hmm. about the, and there's, there's a barrier to entry then. Then we're literally saying, this is for us, right? And look, one of my favorite things that I've ever done is a movie I did, you know, Pierre Moss, Pierre Moss, the clothing line? Oh, yeah, I thought you were talking about one of my products I saw. Yeah, it's yeah, called no, Pierre Moss. Oh, Pierre right. Moss, too. Pierre Moss. Now, listen, a little housekeeping. We have Sports Moss. Sports Moss is what I've been using to get big. Now, I know some of y'all been seeing me and y'all been asking me if I'm going to play the next Black Adam, right? Y'all want to know if I'm going to get into wrestling or into boxing or I'm going to start bodybuilding and all those things. Now, the answer is no, right? I'm developing these broad shoulders and arms and legs because I can, right? I wanted to develop myself into the greater version, but I couldn't do it without the sports moss. Two of these a day, and it increases adenosine triphosphate, which helps deliver that oxygen to my blood while I'm working out, right? And then it helps decrease recovery time. So in this, it says we got the elderberry in there, we got the vitamin D, the sea moss, the zinc, and the cordyceps. Now that conversation, how you tapped in. This is the super saiyan, you understand me, pill right here, yeah. Then we got the vitamin C moss. We have uh, smart moss. So each one does something different. Y'all know we don't be getting enough sun. So you got to get that vitamin D in you anyway to regulate the hormones. You got to get that vitamin C because we don't naturally produce ascorbic acid. So you got to get it through food or some sort of supplementation in order for you to be balanced. You got to get that green tea extract in there. Help build up that immune system. Now we got shrooms, but not the shrooms that give you the psychedelic experience, right? but it is the shrooms that help you increase your psychic abilities, meaning your mind, meaning your brain, right? As we age and we develop, we get old, decrepit, can't remember things, start to lose things. So we got to tap in, especially in a world that's constantly making us mentally exhausted. Then of course we got the gold. Now y'all already know the gold, man, the gold to have us tapped into our electrical wiring systems, to where your brain synapses is firing just like you was a baby. You're constantly developing, regrowing and reflowing, right? So if you want to tap into those energy systems and mineralizations that I use to tap into my body, rather than being infused with the chemicalizations to where you no longer got body, y'all come tap into the gold water pills, man. Pure, Mo Pure Monster clothing line, I did, a, I did a, you know, a fashion film for him. And we decided instead of just, you know, models walking around in clothes, we mm -hmm. decided to make it a short. Mm -hmm. And it's based on Kirby's life. Mm. It's called Seven Mothers. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, the thing that ignited the thing was that I want to make something that's about black people. I think black people just living life is the revolutionary statement, right. is what he said to me. Just being a family, not the struggle and the thing and all this kind of stuff. So we started talking and building, and then we came to the fact that his mother had died when he was very young, and he was raised by seven women. Mother's friends, aunts, you know, grandma, all these seven women raised him. And I wanted to tell the story, or what I wanted to say about the world and the way the world is, is that the spirit lives beyond the body, okay? So this, this film is about him being raised by these seven women, but also how his mother now speaks to him. And one of the aunts says, your mother, you're, we come to the church to, worship in the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a living thing without a living body. Your mother's spirit, your spirit is tied to your flesh. Your mother has no more ties. Mm -hmm. So she'll speak to you in dreams and coincidences. You can hear her if you listen. Mm -hmm. And that is what that film is about and where that goes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not unusual to show that movie and people start crying. I've shown it in meetings, people leave the room to go cry. And then what will 
happen every now and then is I'll show it to somebody and they'll just be very quiet and say, my mother died when I was young, mm. right? And so the film started becoming, I saw, and I knew when I made it, because I've been touched by a spirit after death, that it would use the film to speak to other people. Mm. You know what I mean? Whose spirit was that? It was a friend of mine, was, you know, a friend of mine when I was in my 20s. And it is, uh, it's always been a, a story I've wanted to tell. And that, and it comes up often in works, but that film was one of my favorite pieces and the way it connected. And like you're saying, when people watch it of any race, what they see is themselves. And they say to themselves, if my friends, if my friend died, I'm there for the kid. Right. I'm in. They, 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 they everyone knows that feeling that I would, I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, I've, even I have a show coming out uh, probably this summer. We, we remade Robin Hood. Okay. It's a modern day Robin Hood. It's already finished? It's finished. We're, mm. we, we finished the episodes. We got a, like a couple of effect shots to finish up, but I think it's done. Um, and it's Robin with a Y. It's a black girl. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, they live in the projects at the corner of Sherwood and Forest. Get it, Sherwood. Y'all know Robin Hood? <laughs> For y'all that understand, because Robin Hood lived in Sherwood Forest. Oh, anyways. Uh, ah, you see what I'm saying? Uh, Sherwood and Forest. You see. We'll put up some B-roll. We'll, we'll put a B-roll, but that was the thing with the old Robin Hood. But we modernized it. But we got a bunch of black kids. All the, all the characters are played by black folks, right? Um, but at no point in this thing do we say, that's why black people need to, you know, just don't. We made the point with right. the cast. Right, I don't need, need now to hit you with another, you know what I'm saying? Because you know, look, we all, we all also have to be a little realistic. If you want that broader audience, mm -hmm. it's a mix of folks and they- And it's, I feel like it's, it's humanizing black people to not be subjected to our worst experiences as our identity. Yeah. Right, and so that's what we export around the world. When you see a black person, you connect our worst experiences, that's who they are. And that's not who we are. Right, and we don't have enough hero tales, right? Like, we start at slavery so much, we don't really think about what was happening before, right? We existed millions of years. We've been here since the beginning, right? I want to see stories of Hannibal Barca. I want to see a young black man conquer the Roman Empire, riding elephants. That would do well for my self-image, mm. right? When I was young, I seen Superman soaring through the skies, but he don't look like me. And it's cool to fantasize about the powers, but what you realize is that they don't have to ever say Superman is white, but the way he makes decisions is white. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know ain't bro that can fly, ain't working no job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he definitely ain't gonna try to disguise behind glasses. Yeah. You gotta at least get some shades. Yeah. You can't see his eyes. <laughs> So you know by the culture of Superman, he not black, right? But somehow he used the sun to get power, mm -hmm. right? But it's, that's, you know, it's what it is. It's like, so I, want, I always think about the films that I want to see and eventually I want to get into creating documentaries and then films, right? And that's why I love doing high level conversations and we decided to take the approach of like, think about creating a production rather than creating a podcast. So we say, let's go and make a show, right? And so this show has elements and central themes and B-roll and we play around with the sound effects and things of that nature and it, it makes it uh, an experience that can compete with the time that people will usually use to watch entertainment. Right now you're watching edutainment, right? So people sit there and watch two, three hours of it and it proves that people are interested in more things, right? And so I think by the end of the year, we could probably get to, you know, uh, 100 million views right, if we do things the right way, right? And media is such a powerful form because it inspires and it creates holographic images in the mind that can get crystallized and then inform reality, right? And so individuals such as yourself and actors and producers, you know, you all have a great ability, right, to shape narrative and consciousness, right? I do it with education. Right, informing people to think for themselves, 
which makes them take different routes in their decision making, which changes the life and the narrative that they live, right? But in film, you get to take these ideas, these emotions, and you get to present it to people and say, here it is. And so for you know, our people, creating films that's not about our struggles reminds us or, or takes us out from constantly attaching to those struggles. Right, like, hey, you're a black man, you go through issues, there's race problems, there's poverty, like, people don't like you. Like, damn, <laughs> remind me again, you know? But the reality of it is, is it's not, that's not really the reality all the time, right? It's a very small aspect of reality. Because even racism, you can experience racism by watching it, not by going through it, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what the experience is. So if I'm watching racism on the film, I'm experiencing that. So you're inducing trauma that never would have happened. But now I see a mirror image of myself going through something and it's creating PTSD, right? Or triggering that PTSD state that we live in. So films about, you know, the, the Nanny of Maroons in Jamaica, right? I want to see how she conquered the army of one, right? Like most people don't even know who she is. I yeah. want to see the stories of Marcus Garvey and him, you know, going and, and getting the ideas about creating the Black Star Alliance ship and getting certificates. Like, these change the way people think about themselves. I think Woman King was a, a great film, especially cinematically, that showed black women in a light that we've never seen them in a way that it captured the essence, right, and the beauty of it and had us thinking about what was going on in Africa, even though that's still connected to, right, enslavement. So it's like we can create a cinematically beautiful film like that, but have something that draws into a higher conclusion of thought, right? Something that makes us believe that, yo, we're moving forward. Like, oh, yo, damn, that's how we did it. Like, if you go build, you know, everybody want to take credit for building the pyramids. But let me be honest, the people who built it, they painted themselves on the wall, right? So imagine leaving a picture of yourself and people still say that ain't you. <laughs> So if we just use the depiction and representation that they left behind, that's respecting them and how they saw themselves. Regardless of how you try to colorize it, let's just make a movie in their image, mm -hmm. right? So there's no debate. I've been to Egypt and I've seen it on the walls. I've seen the sisters with the, the braids, right? There wasn't no appropriation back then. I know who that was, right? I've seen the yoga practices, right? It was fly. So we have to, not only do that, and I'll end on this point, representation is often, you know, pivoted for a small group of people, right? They control who gets represented. But I have the idea about ethnicity, right? Like, we're both black men. There's plenty of black people in Canada to America to Africa, but we have different ethnic backgrounds. And what they do is, they say we want representation, but they only include a certain ethnic background each time, right? So you're not going to see a black Muslim conscious man, right, on the film anywhere, right? We have Malcolm X and Spike Lee got in trouble for it, right? And so it's like you can't talk representation unless it's equal. They talk representation when they want to handpick who's represented in the courtier, right? And so therefore, we don't never get to see ourselves, even though that's a black man, he don't have my culture. He doesn't make decisions like I would make. And so they're still embedding themselves, right, in our representation. And so that's a dangerous thing. So we, that's why I want to get into creating myself so that I can create myself. It's important, man. Look, the, the reality is um, part of what doesn't come up a lot when it comes to the black man, black woman gap, professional gap is some white man's gonna hire, he has to hire someone of color. Mm. Does he want sexy, swaggy you walking around the office? Mm -mm. This is his little power play. This is where he gets to flirt and be the most, you know what I'm saying? Right. He's the guy up in here. Right. He brings you. Oh, it's over. But if you, you can hire a black woman and not have to worry about it. In fact, he gets to flirt with her too. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. the, 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 be clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of us have to use our imagination that much to understand that's what the fuck has happened. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that applies to decisions of things that are gonna get made. This keeps on going and going and going. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a realm of film. There are types of films. The films you're talking about, 
we got to do that ourselves. Well, I'm glad you said that. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen. I do want to, before we wrap it up, I do want to lead you in a meditation. Oh, let's get it done. I want to get you and everybody here. Everyone down to do a little meditation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. We've been talking about it. All right. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Gold Water. All right, so get yourself in a comfortable position. Comfortable position. All right. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath in through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Now, as you breathe in and exhale, I want you to visualize and repeat the number three, three times. Three, three, three. Now as you continue to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, I want you to think about the top of your head where bone meets skin. Think about and feel the flow of blood and tell the top of your head to relax. Think about your forehead, your eyebrows and eyes. Breathe into that section of yourself. And as you exhale, tell it all to relax. Think about your nose, cheek, mouth, chin. As you breathe in, breathe into that part of yourself. And as you exhale, Tell it all to relax. Think about, about the back of your head, your neck, throat. Breathe into that part of your body. And as you exhale, tell it all to relax. Think about your chest, shoulders, arms, elbows forearms and hands. Breathe into that part of your body. And as you exhale, tell it all to relax. Think about your abdomen and groin. Breathe into that part of your body. And as you exhale through your mouth, tell it all to relax. Think about your legs, the muscles, the calves, the feet, all the way down to the tips of your toes. Breathe into that part of your body, thin through your nose, and as you exhale through your mouth, tell it all to relax. Now breathe in to your entire body And as you exhale through your mouth, tell it all to relax. As you breathe in, I want you to visualize the number two, three times as you exhale. Two, two, two. Here, I want you to visualize a place in nature, a place in nature you have been to. Using all your senses, see this place in nature. Sight, hearing, touch, see it, feel it, using all your senses. Take a moment to be and interact in this place in nature.
Now as you breathe in and as you exhale, visualize the number one three times. One, one, one. You are now in a deeper, healthier state of mind. I'm going to count from nine to zero. As I count, visualize the numbers and count along yourself. Visualize and count along with me as you move into a deeper, healthier state of mind. In through the nose, out through the mouth, and nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Looking at the zero, see the inside of the zero open up a porthole. Walk through it. On the other side of this porthole, in this deeper, healthier state of mind, you see yourself. Watch yourself achieving a goal you have. Watch yourself using all your senses. Where are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? As you achieve this life goal of yours, take a moment to watch yourself achieve your life goal. Now, step inside of yourself and through your own eyes, see yourself achieving your life goal. Now, as you achieve this life goal, from the area of your heart, project great gratitude, love, and expectancy. I'm gonna count from zero to nine. As I count, visualize and count the numbers with me. And when I make a sound with my hand, open your eyes feeling refreshed and awake. Zero. One. Two. Three. Feel yourself moving higher and higher. Four. Five. Six, higher and higher. Seven, eight, nine, eyes open. How you feel? Feel here, yeah. present. How y'all feel? Meditation, mindfulness, the ability to control your psychic energy, your breath, your key, your ka, this is your fire. When we let our fire get loose, we start to get angry. That's when we can't control our breathing. 
That's when we lose control of our heart, our spirit, our mind, and no longer in line. Every single day, we have to fight to maintain control of ourselves and not allow our lower selves and lower inclinations to sleep in and take over. We have to fight to make sure that the attention is always here at the crown, right? And not here at the root. And so when we learn how to tap into ourselves and use tools like mindfulness and meditation, we're activating our ancestral intelligence so that we can use that in the arsenal as generals as we fight this war of life. I'm 19 Keys, and I'm here with the good brother, Director X, and you just watch High Level Conversations. Peace. To the highest level. Make sure y'all come with us. The highest level tour is, you know, it's, it's a moment in, in history that we get to think about and relish in and be a part of. This is me proving my thought leadership. This is me implementing the ideas and reinvigorating the spirit that we're going to need to win the future right now.